There is a well-known saying, there but for the grace of God go I. But rarely, if ever, has this been more appropriate than in today's episode of Tales from the Hangman's Record. The year 1953 was a notable one in the history of British crime that saw a number of infamous criminals go to the gallows. It was also to lead, eventually, to the forming of the Homicide Act four years later. And while many of the cases from this year passed into the annals of true crime, Craig and Bentley, John Christie and even Poison and Mrs Merrifield, this horrific tale from the late spring of that year was one of the lesser known but nonetheless tragic cases. It was approaching nine o'clock, Tuesday morning the 17th of November 1953, and despite the chill in the air, a large crowd was gathering outside the gates of the imposing Leicester Jail in the East Midlands of England. Traffic slowed to a crawl on Welford Road as it passed the prison with many of the 200 spilling out off the pavement. There hadn't been an execution in the city since 1944 and a growing throng, a mix of the curious and passers-by on the way to work, stood side by side in silence as the clock struck the fateful hour. In the factories opposite, workers paused to look out the window towards a grim Victorian building. The prisoner who had been counting down his last minutes inside the jail had elicited little sympathy for his brutal crime as had horrified the whole county just a few months earlier. Shortly after nine, a warder emerged and pinned the notices on the gate showing the law had taken its course, justice was done and the prisoner was dead. As the crowd filed to read the notices, one man pondered the luckiest of escapes. Had the gods not looked down kindly on him, the hangman and his assistant but had just put to death his killer. Dressed in brown overalls, 30-year-old bricklayer Dennis Goodyear was on his way to work when he passed the prison and joined the crowd queuing to read the notices. Dennis Goodyear was a lucky man and he knew it. Six months earlier, fate had smiled upon Dennis Goodyear and allowed him the chance to be outside the prison. But for a 12-year-old girl, out walking her pet dog after finishing school, fate had chosen her as its victim when she found herself in the wrong place, at the wrong time. On Friday the 22nd of May 1953, a young gang of boys and girls were enjoying the summer sunshine. They'd finished school for the week and were playing in the woods beside Blue Bank Spinney off Cork Lane, Blaby, Leicestershire. Suddenly they heard a scream and a dog barking near the canal. A short time later they saw a man with messy hair and overalls disappear into the wood. Finishing their adventures, they split up and made their way home for tea. Two boys, John Warren and David Dryden, were cutting through the wood when they stumbled across the body of a young girl, partly hidden in a thicket, covered in bluebells. They hurried home and the police were called, and under the command of Superintendent Clayton, officers searched the area and began their inquiries. They were quickly joined at the scene by Birmingham-based pathologist James Webster. He found that although battered and bruised, the girl had actually died of strangulation and a lady's silk stocking and her school tie were both tied tightly around her neck. Taken to the local mortuary, the body was soon identified as 12-year-old Janet Warner, who lived close by at 141 Leicester Road, Aylstone. Her distraught parents told police they were already concerned when the pet dog Rex had returned home alone a short time earlier. Her father told detectives that he had last seen Janet before school that morning, but she would normally take her dog for a walk along the canal after school. On finding the body, police dispatched hundreds of officers, special constables and tracker dogs to find the killer, and door-to-door inquiries were made. Roads were closed within 30 miles of the crime and roadblocks put in place. A light aircraft was dispatched from a nearby aerodrome to help the search, but it proved fruitless. Police were baffled by the brutal attack. Janet had not been sexually assaulted, nor had she been robbed. It appeared the crime was completely without motive. The hunt for the killer only lasted two days. In due course, police officers were called to an address in Uppingham Road, Leicester, about seven miles from the scene of the murder. 
they were looking to interview a 31-year-old Irish labourer, Joseph Christopher Reynolds, whose name had cropped up in inquiries for persons in the area with a criminal record for assaulting women. Reynolds had served a prison sentence for an attack on a woman in South Wales several years earlier. Described by his landlady as the perfect lodger, quiet, clean and tidy, Reynolds was found to have gone missing. He was quickly apprehended. Once his photograph and description had been circulated, he was spotted by PC John Milner and picked up on the outskirts of Leicester in the early hours of Monday morning, May the 25th. Reynolds didn't put up any resistance when arrested and taken into custody. Joseph Christopher Reynolds was born in Dublin in 1922. Educated by the Christian brothers, he was known as a softly spoken, shy and polite man and a bit of a loner who rarely drank alcohol. He had joined the Irish Army in 1939, but was discharged in less than a year. Reynolds came to England in 1943 to join the RAF, and following D-Mob, he moved extensively around England and Wales before settling in Leicester, where he found work as a casual labourer, working when and where he could, but at the time of his arrest, he had been out of work for several weeks. Reynolds made his first court appearance on the day after the arrest, where after a brief hearing he was remanded in custody for one week. There was to be several remand appearances over the summer, and at the time it was said to be one of the longest series of remands on record. On Monday the 22nd of June 1953, Reynolds made his final remand appearance at Leicester Magistrates Court, when the whole story of the murder was revealed. Reynolds made a startling revelation. He said he had decided to commit the murder several days prior to that Friday evening. For the last ten days he had had the urge to kill someone. His original plan was to murder a man who had walked each day along the canal at Aylstone. Reynolds said that over that week he loitered on the bridge over the canal pondering his next move. Finally he decided to put his plan into action on the Friday afternoon. It was then that the fates intervened. Dennis Goodyear had walked along the canal path every afternoon after finishing work at the local pub where he was installing a new fireplace. The job had finished on Thursday the 21st of May and that was the last time he walked along the canal. Goodyear had been aware of the man's presence and felt unease as he approached on the last couple of occasions, feeling sure he was either going to be mugged or attacked. On Friday afternoon, Reynolds decided that was the day and had a silk stocking in his pocket ready to strangle the man when he approached. When Goodyear failed to appear, Reynolds was about to admit defeat when he noticed Janet Warner and her dog appear. Reynolds approached a young girl, telling her he had seen some rabbits in the wood beside the bridge and did she want to see them. No sooner had Janet stepped off the path than Reynolds attacked her, quickly stifling her scream as a dog barked. Janet fought for her life, but Reynolds was much too strong and after a short struggle, punched and kicked her unconscious. He then tied the stocking and school tie tightly around her neck, causing death by strangulation. I had a mixture of feelings, he told the court. I could not stop. I saw the stocking with which I meant to strangle her lying on the ground. I picked it up and tied it around her neck to make sure she was dead. The crowded courtroom listened in horror as Reynolds calmly continued. The little girl was very brave in the face of death. I hope that when my time comes, I will be half as brave. Joseph Reynolds stood trial before Mr Justice Pilcher at Leicester Assizes on Monday the 26th of October. It was to be one of the shortest trials on record. As though he wished to plead to the charge, Reynolds, wearing a double-breasted blue suit, an open collared white shirt, smiled and said guilty. His defence counsel, Mr R.C. Vaughan, had prepared a defence of insanity, but the guilty plea meant there would now be no trial, and without any trial taking place, there could be no chance of his counsel putting forward a defence. Mr Justice Pilcher suggested to Reynolds he should heed his defence counsel's advice and allow them to try to fight for his life. Reynolds, however, wouldn't hear of it, and declared that since he had intended to kill someone, he intended to pay the price for it. 
he told the court he was very sorry and deserved the extreme penalty. By this plea, Reynolds has as good as signed his own death warrant. Asked if he had anything to say before the mandatory sentence of death was passed, Reynolds said, I have. I can only say I am happy to meet my death. I deserve the extreme punishment for my crime. I am happy, but at the same time, heartily sorry for the little girl and for the grief I have caused her parents. The black cat was placed on the judge's wig and sentence of death was passed in the usual way. Reynolds buried his head in silent prayer as the judge spoke before being quickly escorted from the dock. From arriving at the court in the prison van to heading down the stairs after the judge had passed sentence, just four minutes had elapsed. Reynolds was returned to Leicester Jail and placed in the condemned cell. It was now a simple case of fixing the date of execution and securing the services of the hangman and his assistant. Moves were made to have Reynolds' sentence commuted to life imprisonment, but this was rejected, and at nine o'clock, some three weeks later, Joseph Reynolds was hanged by Albert Pierpoint and Robert Stewart. He was the last man hanged in Leicester Jail. There is an interesting footnote to this case. Among the group of children in the woods when Janet was murdered was nine-year-old Susan Johnston. She was later to find fame under her married name Sue Townsend as the author of such notable children's books as The Secret Diary of Adrian Mole. Child killers have always been seen as the worst of criminals. Since the death penalty was abolished in the 1960s, almost all campaigns for restoration have included for the murder of children. This dates back almost to immediately after hanging was suspended in 1965 when the crimes of Myra Hindley and Ian Brady filled the newspapers. Since then, each time a child murder makes the news, be that Soam killer Ian Huntley, Robert Black, Roy Whiting or nurses Beverly Allitt and Lucy Letby, the outcry is to bring back the rope for these killers. Yet, what many people don't realise is that after Joseph Reynolds was hanged in 1953, barely half a dozen more child killers followed him to the gallows, the last being Ernest Harding hanged in Birmingham in August 1955. As we've seen in recent episodes of Tales from the Hangman's Record, this is another example of the failings of the 1957 Homicide Act. In deciding what crimes carry the death penalty, murdering someone and stealing a pound from their pocket would send you to the gallows, whereas brutally strangling and violating a young child would only see them sentenced to life imprisonment. And in many cases, life imprisonment would mean serving barely 10 years. Thank you for watching and listening to this episode of Tales from the Hangman's Record. If you've enjoyed it, can you please press like and subscribe to the channel. Your subscriptions are very important and help spread the word and keep the channel growing. There is no charge to subscribe, you will not be bombarded with spam or junk videos, emails or messages. You will simply be informed each time a video is launched and invited to watch it as a premiere along with fellow subscribers. Check out my website stevefielding.com for information about all my books including details of new releases, updates on a forthcoming YouTube channel and also plans on forthcoming Zoom talks and podcasts. Do you think Reynolds deserved to hang for his crime? Use the comments below for your thoughts on this case and for suggestions for further episodes in the Tales from the Hangman's Record series. So, until the next time, thank you and goodbye.